I talk all the time about getting a record deal is like getting drafted. It ultimately, in a weird way, kind of means nothing. Mm-hmm. Right? If you get drafted in the NFL, it doesn't mean you're playing, it doesn't mean you're starting, it doesn't mean you're even dressing with the team on, mm-hmm. on the first week of the season. Mm-hmm. Right? Just getting drafted gets you in mm-hmm. the door. Good morning there, folks. Welcome to RenManMusicInBusiness.com. My name is Steve Rennie, and I am the Ren Man, and this little program is called Ren Man Live. Hey, if you're looking to do something great in this music business, but you think you might need a little help, uh, you're in the right place here today. Each week, I'm getting together with some of the smartest, most talented folks in the music business to talk shop about today's music business. And today, we've got a great guest. His name is Tom Mackay. He's the executive vice president and general manager of the West Coast for Republic Records. Uh, Tom is the man who signed country superstars Florida, Georgia Line, amongst many others. Um, he's here today to talk about A&R and his job and is going to answer some of your questions along the way. Um, But before we meet Tom, I'd like to say hello to my illustrious crew. I say all the time, if you want to do something big, you're probably going to need some help, and I do too. So over there in the corner on the controls uh, is uh, my main man. Whoa, fuck yeah, there he is, Cody, the Trojan man, Romness in the house. Okay, I'm going to take the fucking batteries out of that thing, Cody. You're getting a little out of hand. the softer touch in that corner, and I say this loosely, is our newest addition to the team. Her name is Killer Kira O'Neill from Miami, Florida, now <laughs> local here in California, down in West Hollywood. Nice to have you, Kira, Thank you. here today. Nice on the to here. Phone's already ringing. Um, all right, folks. You know, people ask me all the time, how do you learn the music business? And I think it's pretty simple, actually. You hang out with smarter, more talented people than yourself, and you ask questions. And if you do that, it's hard not to learn something. Now, if you're looking to learn, you're in the right place. Today is our 102nd webcast. Hard to imagine, huh, Code? Um, and what makes our show unique is that you folks can actually be a part of it. So if you've ever bitched about not being able to get an A&R person on the phone, today is your lucky day. Um, we got a saying around here at the camp. Uh, if you're going to learn something, you need to ask questions. If you don't ask, you don't get. And you won't learn anything. So uh, let's talk to you about how you can be part of the act. Kira, you want to help the folks out there? Sure. Yeah. Um, Well, for all the early planners, you can post in advance on the Runman MB page. Uh, So there's our event page. Um, You can also post questions in the crowd surfing chat room, which is streaming live right alongside our YouTube video or live stream. And you can tweet at us, hashtag Renman Live um, on Twitter, and that will hit into our crowd surfing chat feed as well. And f- don't forget that you can always call in live to the show, which our phone is already ringing off the hook, so I guess everybody's on board for that. I know, it's, it's people calling, <laughs> all my bills are paid. <laughs> and uh, make sure that you are a registered member on the Renman MB site, so you Come can get your- they can do your, that code. Yeah, so you can you get go. your questions in and posted for you know early advanced, early planners, and uh, th- that wraps it up. Yeah, that's good. And I want to say <laughs> a thank you to the folks. If you look on our web or event page, you'll see that little crowd surfing chat uh, uh, area there. That's from the fine folks at Crowd Surfing is the name of the company in Chicago, Illinois. Um, it's a great little app. Helps you guys get in the act here. But strangely enough, or interesting enough, it is uh, the founder of that company is a drummer by the name of Jimmy Chamberlain. We're working a small band out of Chicago called the Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, anyway, I want to say hello to all the folks at Crowd Surfing who are probably walk watching today. All right, enough of all that business stuff here. Uh, Let's get down to business here. Uh, Our guest today has enjoyed a long and successful 15 plus year history at Republic Records. He's one of the top A&R execs in the business who signed some big, big acts like Florida Georgia Line, Eli Young, Three Doors Down, and Hinder, just to name a few. Uh, Those folks collectively have moved about 40 million albums. Um, He's currently the executive vice president President General Manager of the West Coast for Republic Records. Uh, he's here today to talk about his role as an A&R executive and take your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome my good friend, Mr. Tom Mackay. How are you? How are you? Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, there you go. No problem. Uh, 
first off, I want to thank you uh, for joining us here today. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time out Absolutely. of your day here um, to join us. It's, it means a lot to folks. There are lots of people out there trying to learn. Um, lots of the folks that are watching our show today, Tom, are just getting started in the music business. And everybody's kind of looking for that easy access or that checklist of how to get started. In my experience, you know, having spoken to hundreds of people over the years in the business, there's as many different stories of getting started in the business, it seems, as there are people that are, are doing it. So I'm going to ask you the same question <laughs> I've asked everybody. How did Tom Mackay get started in this wacky music business? Uh, well, my story is quite wacky. Um, actually, my story began with... Uh, uh, I had a huge dream as a kid to play professional golf. Uh, imagine that. Yeah. And uh, grew up in central Florida, uh, played golf in high school, went to college in Columbus, Georgia, and uh, went on a golf scholarship at a school at the time that was called Columbus College, and now it's called Columbus State University. Um, played on the golf team, was on a couple of uh, national championship winning teams, and I started to get some sponsors. There were some financial guys in Columbus who were like, hey, we're going to give you some money, we're going to sponsor you. And at the time, there was a thing called the Hooters Tour, which still exists today, mm. which you know well. Yeah. And so I went out and I did six months on the Hooters Tour um, and tried to kind of learn, try to get my thing going. And then about six months in, my sponsors went awful quiet. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the, the, the financial faucet shut off and I mm. found myself back home in Daytona Beach at a Mexican restaurant waiting tables. Uh, so my brother is a caddy on the professional tour. My brother's a guy, Jim Mackay. His nickname on TV is Bones. Bones Mackay. And he and I grew up uh, together, and we were huge music fans, along with my, our, our sister Leslie. Um, and our, our favorite band at the time was this band, R.E.M. Uh, my brother was living in Athens at the time and uh, found out that R.E.M. had gotten invited to play in the first annual, you might have done this, the first annual Fairway to Heaven event at VH1. Did no, I never that? got invited to that. Why is that? Rick Krim was always a good that's buddy. Right, I didn't that's get, right, that's right, that's right. I'm going to make uh, a little note of that, Krim. <laughs> yeah. so, so VH1 does this thing called Fairway to Heaven. It's in Orlando, and Bill Berry, the drummer, and Mike Mills, the bass guitarist, sign up to play. Golfers, yeah. So my brother calls me, he says, I got this crazy idea. I'm going to cold call the management office in Athens and say, I'm a professional caddy. My brother's a professional golfer. We're diehard REM fans. Can we come caddy mm. for these two guys? Mm. Um, of which he cold calls them. And they said, sure. Be on the first tee next Wednesday at 8 o'clock. <laughs> so there we are on the first tee the next Wednesday at 8 o'clock. And we literally play five hours with our musical idols carrying these golf bags and mm. they're telling us stories and we're talking about Oh, you about guys songs. were out there caddying. We were caddying. Oh, I thought you were going to play. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh. We were just caddying for them. So we're out there and we're doing our thing and we're getting to know these guys and the round ends and you're kind of like, okay, this is it. I've had five hours with my, with, with my musical icon of all time mm -hmm. and now it's over. Mm -hmm. And we walk off the green and... Um, Pay no attention, yeah. And they, <laughs> and, they, and they basically sat there and said, okay, great, what are you guys doing? Let's meet for dinner in an hour and a half. And we go to dinner and we went to drinks and at three o'clock in the morning we were hugging it out in a parking lot being best <laughs> friends. And so what ended up happening is is that the Mike Mills and, and Bill Berry and their lawyer manager Burtis Downs, who you know Burtis well. Sure. I played in his golf tournament, Burtis That's right. Downs. That's right. Uh, they became my sponsors. And so I went to South America, I played the South American tour, I went to Asia, I played the Asian tour. And what I would do is I would play three or four weeks of tournament golf, and then I would need a week off. This happened to be when they were touring behind the monster records. So what's the frequency, Kenneth, bang and blame, mm. all those records. Sure. Um, and they were doing this world arena tour. And so what I would do is I would call them up and say, okay, look, I'm burned out. I need a week off. Where are you? I would fly to wherever they were, throw my bags on the bus. We would play golf all day, go to the shows at night, and party after that. And when I got a chance as a music fan um, to basically see the behind the scenes of the business mm -hmm. and really see the machine work, right? That was the beginning. That was when the light bulb kind of went off for me and I was kind of like, wait a second, if I can't make this professional golf thing work, uh -huh. I don't want to go have a job at a bank, no disrespect to bankers, but I was like, I want to be in the arts, I want to be in music, and, and then that was the beginning of it. 
Interesting story. You know, you and I have a parallel. I wanted to be a golf pro too, folks, and uh, it didn't work out. But I can tell you this, because I watched guys like him, <laughs> and I had no chance. Tom's a great golfer. By the way, your 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 brother, his client is uh, Phil Mickelson, by the way, mm -hmm. kind of underselling the caddy there. He's uh, done some fine. There they are, right there. Look at the two of them. <laughs> There they are. By the way, they're one of the greatest acts on TV, those two. <laughs> Folks, if, even if you yep. don't watch golf, yep. you want to watch these two just talking about yep. hitting a shot into a par three. It's great stuff here. Uh, that's interesting stuff. So you didn't go to college to study the music business. Uh, you're not a musician. Correct. Uh, Correct. Just a lover of music. That's exactly right. Um, but you got a little snip. A part I love, too, is friend of band. Very powerful stuff. Friend of the band gets you anywhere, you That's know? Right. That's right. Uh, great stuff. Um, all right. Well, let's talk and take a question here, Code, from one of our, um, from our, one of our uh, uh, excuse me, members. His name is Chris from the Edgar Allan Poe's. We get all these questions posted ahead of time, so I thought, you know, give everybody a little opportunity to talk about what your job is. Here's a question from Chris from the Edgar Allan Poets who's actually from Italy, who now lives here in America. He says, hello, Redman and Tom. What does it mean to be an A&R today? Nowadays, it seems like the people are A&Rs, and the real A&Rs follow what the people are searching and listening on social media. So basically, a discover something is already discovered by the people. Okay? Uh, great segue to you. Talk about what it is an A&R person does. Well, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, an A and R person is actually a content creator, right? They are mm -hmm. actually finding content, um, nurturing it, and helping it achieve its greatest goals. Um, I think at the end of the day, an A and R person is at times a facilitator. They're a promoter. They're a marketer. They're they're everything. At the end of the day, they are the lifeline between the artist, the band, that song, and the label. Mm -hmm. Um, I often sit there and say that a and r people have probably sometimes more intimate conversations with artists than the artists have with their spouses because mm -hmm. you're literally sitting down and sometimes having you know constructively critical conversations about their art, which is an incredibly delicate thing to do yeah um, you know when you look at you know to chris 's question when you look at a and R and how A and R has evolved from the 40s and the 50s, where it was basically, you know, you had some of the living legends who were, you know, at the end of the day, A and R stands for artists and repertoire, mm -hmm. right? You're finding the artists and then you're finding the repertoire and you're marrying them together. Um, and Chris is right; it has evolved in this world that we're in now with social media and with everything being online and on the internet. Um, it has evolved to a uh, to a measure of of discovering things as they are already being discovered, mm. as Chris says. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's one of the beautiful things about it. I think at the end of the day, when I started, uh, you know, 15, 16 years ago, to, to really knock down the door of somebody and get on somebody's radar as an a &R person, mm. you had to have the high-powered manager. Mm. You had to have the high-powered attorney. You had to have all these connections to get mm. there. Now all that stuff doesn't really matter anymore, yeah. right? You mm. can literally be a kid in a garage and, and you know, cut some demos and put them up on iTunes, all on your own, mm -hmm. all from your garage, and the world is your oyster. Yeah. So. I think what's interesting, too, to Chris, and we've talked about these things, is that people were, all of us were always trying to find action in, in validation, even before record you know, bands got signed to labels, whether it was lying around the block yeah. and so forth. Today, we just have so many more tools to kind of... Absolutely. Put our ear up against the wall. So I think, Chris, it's not that anybody thinks doing any different. We just have some new places to look, and it's provided some great opportunities uh, for artists. That's exactly right. You know, it used to be if you couldn't get past Tom's secretary, you were toast, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the world I grew up in. Do mm -hmm. um, we have any questions from the chat room, Kira? We don't right now. Oh, Everyone's it's a quiet little excited. bunch there. There, it's there a quiet are a lot of bunch. comments, though, I have to say that. <laughs> All right, well, tell us some of the comments. How are we doing so far? Um, Renman, you are the man. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right, he's just... Uh, I the man, the man. Okay, well, let me just, by the way, let's take a quick break. I'll show you for the, speaking of the man, if you folks have questions, general questions that aren't about A&R today, I want to show you, go to our website. There's a little section up there called Ask Renman. So for all you folks that wish you had a manager, aren't 
in a position to get one or whatever it might be. Uh, there it is. Post your questions right there. I religiously, uh, well, not religiously, but pretty relentlessly go and answer all those questions. So uh, take a moment there if you got one, and, uh, and I will try to answer that for you. Next question, Tom. You know, you mentioned that an A&R person's primary job is actually going out and identifying, spotlighting, and finding talent. Um, been my experience that every A and R person seems to have their own, you know, particular taste or, or mm -hmm. genres they work in. Some people, one of our friends, Jason Flom, has a really wide radar. Yours is pretty wide as well. Tell me what it is when you're looking to sign an artist. What is it that gets your attention? What is it that attracts you and makes you want to take the leap and sign an artist? Well, I think obviously it has to start with the music. The music has to speak to you, mm -hmm. and it has to be something that you feel like at the end of the day, your company knows how to promote and market to the fullest. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer of the fact, I don't think a lot of, you know, I may be in the minority by saying this, but I'm a big believer in the fact that a record label can't do all genres perfectly. They have their own little niche that they do very, very well, right? And so when you look at Def Jam, and you look at Def Jam's history, and when you look at, yes, they've had success within the rock world, but they, they own another world, right? Yeah. Um, and so when you look at some of these labels like that, I think at the end of the day, as an A&R person, it starts with the music, it starts with meeting the artist and connecting with the artist and believing that the artist has what it takes to go all the way. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got to want it as bad as you do. Um, and How I'm important a, is that attitude it's critical. for you? It's okay. critical. I talk all the time about Getting a record deal is like getting drafted. It ultimately, in a weird way, kind of means nothing, mm. right? If you get drafted in the NFL, it doesn't mean you're playing, doesn't mean you're starting, doesn't mean you're even dressing with the team on, mm -hmm. on the first week of the season, mm -hmm. right? Just getting drafted gets you in mm. the door. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that at Republic all the time, which mm -hmm. is kind of like whatever you did to get signed, all the work that you wanted to, to, to put in, all the time that you put in, at the end of the day, you got to continue that and you got to mm. keep that going, that fire burning within mm -hmm. you as the artist, even once you do get signed. Yeah. Another question, a little follow up question. You, you mentioned that, you know, getting a team and all that stuff, you know, talent, you got to have talent, you got to have songs, right? You got to have a great attitude. How important for you? is the support team behind the, an act, the manager, mm -hmm. the agent, the, the other folks that can make a label's job tougher or easier? I think that there's, well, let me start off by saying there's, a, there's always the exception. When you have that record mm -hmm. that just defies gravity mm -hmm. and is not a hit, mm -hmm. it is a smash, and it's a smash the moment it leaves the door. Mm -hmm. I think in a situation like that, the team around you isn't as important, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But those are one in a million. I think that on the when when you deal with the day-to-day -day realism of the business, as we always sit there and say, this is an unforgiving business. It is brutal. It is a failure-based business. Whether we want to admit it or not, it really is. It is a failure-based business. And so at the end of the day, your team is critical. Your team around mm. you is critical because there's going to come a point mm where the door slams shut and the answer is no, or the song's not a hit, or the tour isn't selling that great. And it really, at the end of the day, it is down to those five or six or seven people in your core that are around you and surround you as an artist that are really gonna help you through those times. Uh, I couldn't agree more, and it's funny, you know, you talk about caddy and golf, and you know, Phil Mickelson, mm -hmm. Bones Mackay. Mm -hmm. That's a team out there. Without you know? a doubt. Uh, Without and, you a know, doubt. Phil's got to hit the shot, but there's a whole lot of stuff mm -hmm. that happens ahead of time. Um, let me ask you another question when you're looking for an artist. You know, we get this, I get asked this a lot. How important is it for you? Now, we talked about that you have all kinds of new places to, to gauge interest and enthusiasm. How important is it for you when you're looking to sign an actor or looking at an actor, their SoundCloud, their YouTube follows, the social media interaction, does that mean something? Does that weigh in the final process when you're trying to decide whether to commit or not? I think it's all critical. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's all kind of the ingredients that go into the meal. Um, I don't think that one outweighs another, mm -hmm. but I think it kind of, I think that each of them, when you lay them out and you look at them together, they paint the picture as to what the band is. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, you know, going back to Chris's thing about earlier about the fact of looking at it, you mm. made the point of, hey, in 1973, we had metrics. It was waiting in line for a show or it was selling out of merch, mm -hmm. right? It was a yeah. great metric or, you know, whatever it was. And so, um, you know, I feel like, you know, um, at the end of the day, what I try to do and what we do at Republic is we look at all of it. Mm -hmm. We look at every little bit mm -hmm. of it and we try our best to make a judgment and an educated guess at times as to, you know, what we feel like can go all the way. Mm -hmm. um, and it right. also, by the way, you know, let's talk for a second about not just bands, but let's mm -hmm. talk about things like movies and soundtracks mm -hmm. and television shows. <clears throat> it's the same thing. Yeah. It's looking at that and being like, okay, how can we weave our way mm -hmm. into this world? And then as I like to say to, to, to bands, you know, when you're an unsigned artist, you're painting with five colors, and when you're a signed artist, you're painting with 55 colors. Mm -hmm. It's still your painting. Yeah. All we do is provide you with mm -hmm. more colors to choose from. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an important point for artists out there because um, today more so than ever, because of all the tools they have, artists can go a long way to shaping their own image and their own identity, where in the past, I think there were artists that thought, well, I'll, the label or somebody will tell me what to do. Not true today. Um, all right, we got a question on there for, on the phone. Uh, I think that'll be actually a little bit more appropriate later. Uh, so tell them to hang on for one second if that's done. Let me ask you about something else. You've been an A&R person now for a while. A&R people are ultimately judged by the artists they sign and is uh, uncomfortable as it might be, you tend to keep your job longer as an A&R person when you sign some acts that sell records, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so cool is cool, but paying the bills is, uh, is another. Talk about some of the bands that you signed over the year. What was your first signing when you got to be an A&R guy? Uh, the first one, uh, which was a signing and a, and a record that I made, was a, a band out of Sacramento, California called Oleander. Okay. And they were kind of coming along in the kind of like the it was the post-Nirvana but pre-Creed rock era. You have to understand that mm. in the, for the first decade of my career as an A&R guy, I was just making rock records. I just mm. I live and breathe rock music. You're Still do to this day, yeah. and I'm ah. I'm heartbroken about kind of the state of the rock industry right now. You and me both. Okay, Cody, throw I us mean, a towel, would I you? Mean, I'm just, it's Fuck. unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, one of these days it'll come back. But yeah. um, I signed this band out of Sacramento um, and made the record, and. Uh, it was sold 700,000 copies, had a number one hit with a song called Why I'm Here, which was a big, went to number one at Active Rock and top ten at Alternative Rock. And that was it. We were kind of, I was off to the races and so was, so was Republic at the, yeah, as well. Mm. Uh, let me talk about a couple other bands you signed here. Pardon me, folks, I'm going through my script here. Um, you, three Doors Down, Hinder. Florida, George Line. I wanted you to tell that Florida. Three Doors, what was your first big, 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 you know, one where everybody goes, oh my God, this guy's on us. I remember Three Doors Down. You signed that band? So going back to Chris, <clears throat> talking about indicators. Mm. Yeah. And this is pre, you know, this is pre the internet and pre Facebook, and I'm really going to date myself with this story. We used to have printouts. Turn it off. Where you could go online, right? Mm -hmm. And you could get a breakdown of record stores in a market. Mm -hmm. And if a song was getting played in that market, you could then call the record store and you would talk to record clerks, okay? So we got a tip, there's a radio station in Biloxi, Mississippi called WCPR and there's a great program director there named Kenny Vest. And Kenny Vest called up my boss, Monty Lippman, and said, hey, I'm giving you a heads up, there's this unbelievable record called Kryptonite by a band named Three Doors Down. And so Monty, you know, came up and we talked about it and we started pulling the store sheets for Biloxi, Mississippi from Walmart to Joe's Taxidermy and Tapes, right? And when we would in the old days call a record store, you'd be like, hey, you know, do you know this record? It's mm. getting spun on this station. And they'd be like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah maybe, may, maybe one or two people a week come in and pick up the record. Not really sure. I kind of know what you're talking about. Every single store we called, hey, do you know the song Kryptonite? And you don't even finish the sentence. Sense, yeah. You don't even mention the band. You don't even mention where they're from. They, they heard Kryptonite, and it was like, oh my gosh, we can't keep the CDs in stores. Mm -hmm. People are, 30 to 40 to 50 people a day are coming in. So literally, Monty gets on a plane and flies to Biloxi that day, and we have no, we have no meeting set up. 
We know that the lead singer's last name is Arnold. That's all that we know. And so we start calling the Arnold families. This sounds like a Biloxi, bad segment from CSI or something. I'm serious, you know? <laughs> but this is literally how the whole thing went down. And that's one of those records, Three Doors Down and Kryptonite, where I told you earlier about it almost makes, I mean, they had a great team around them. But let me tell you something. Mm. Duke, the dog, mm. and my mom could have managed that band for the first couple of years because yeah. those records were just it was wrong. It's interesting you say that because, you know, people are always looking for these easy answers and stuff, right? Yeah. And they're looking for big explosions and stuff. But, you know, more often than not, you get things like this where something's happening somewhere. You know, Jay yeah. Boberg talked about when he was on the show. And you and you build a little fire there. But it's, I talk about this idea of timing and lighting all the time where the right place, right time, yeah. right band, all of a sudden amazing things can happen, right? Yeah. And this one sounds like another one you could put in the file of great time and lighting, you know, you guys on the sniff being able to get the indicators and turn it into money. Um, Look, I, I just want to share one thing for your, for, your, for your viewers and for your fans. This, this is an unbelievable story about Three Doors Down. They were a cover band. So Biloxi has legalized gambling. Mm -hmm. And they were a cover band in high school, these high school kids, that were able on a Friday, Saturday night to go into these casinos and they would play two sets, an hour and a half each, mm. of basically Bush songs on repeat, right? <laughs> they would just go in and they would play these rock records for the, the, the gamblers and mm. that's how they started to make some money. They took some money together, they went into a studio, they cut five songs, and they pressed up 5,000 copies of a five song EP and they sold it. The first four songs when you put the disc in didn't mm. play. <laughs> And the fifth song on the disc was Kryptonite. Kryptonite. So actually, I bet you in retrospect, I thought, oh, what brilliant marketing this yeah. is. It's like yeah. four, then nothing, and then yeah. boom, Kryptonite. You know? So you talk about right time, right place, oh, magic God. moment. The song that was the magic moment was the only song oh, that yeah. actually worked <laughs> on the disc. Oh, folks, you want to know why I have no hair and lines? Because this shit happens all the time, but that's new. I haven't heard that one. Yeah. I was telling the story to Cody when you are about the band I managed for a while. A great band, Primal Scream. Mm -hmm. right? I'm managing him for two seconds in. And, um, go over to England, and Bobby Gillespie's showing me the artwork for, for Give Out, but Don't Give Up. And it was the rebel flag, right, on one side, and a picture of Eddie Hazel on the back side. So he showed me the image. I was like, great. Two months later, the record comes out. Howie Klein of Warner Brothers sends me the artwork. And I call him and go, Howie, where the fuck? There's no name of the band. There's <laughs> what? He goes, Steve, they told me you approved it. And I said, I didn't think they'd never create me. They might not put the thing on there. Anyway, crazy stuff happens in this music business, folks, all the time. Great story uh, about that. Let me, uh, another great rock story, folks. Um, you and I were out playing golf uh, one day, and you told me a great story about your most recent uh, uh, signing. Uh, Florida Georgia line. You got a picture of those guys, uh, Code. Um, what a great looking dude! That is so. That is so rock. There, I, I can't even tell you. What is that? A pool in Vegas or something? Uh, anyway, you told me this great story that spoke to all kinds of great lessons for people about loyalty, about networking, about making things personal, and, and again, maybe a little bit of timing and lighting. Talk to the folks about how um, the connection between Hinder. Tom McKay, a manager in a band, turns into you yeah. riding the biggest success story in country music today. So uh, uh, in, wow, I can't even remember, 2005, um, a, a, a great executive with great ears, um, a guy named Andrew Brightman, sends me an MP3, a corrupted MP3 that is just, that's literally a verse and a chorus of a song, and I pick and I listen to this thing. I'm like, oh my god, this is like a one hit. It's like one listen hit, right? So I call him up and I said, what's the deal with this band? And he goes, they're from Oklahoma City. They're called Hinder. And I said, send me more music. And he goes, that's all I got. He goes, but you need to go get this because it's starting to heat up. One of those great moments where you literally grab your wallet, grab your keys, go to the airport. <laughs> no bag, no toothbrush, no nothing. So I go to Oklahoma City and I land that night and I'm sitting there with this band, great guys, great band, and literally every five minutes, Jason Flom is calling and Craig Kalman's calling and this one's calling and that one's calling and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I got no shot to get this mm -hmm. band, right? So we end up signing Hinder and we make this record and it comes out in 2006 and it sells three million records and it has two number one hits, a song called Get Stone and then it had a really big crossover pop record called Lips of an Angel. Mm -hmm. And 
when we started working with Hinder, going back to that question you asked mm. earlier about the team, mm -hmm. the manager was a guy named Chief. That's his nickname. Chief was his name. Chief. God, I love that. I call her by Chief when I can't remember their that, name. That was his. That's his nickname. He's a wonderful guy from Vancouver, Canada, and at the time, Chief was the front of house sound engineer for Nickelback. <laughs> And like anybody who's industrious and smart and aggressive and ambitious, he's looking to grow and he's looking for ways to improve his career and all that sort of stuff. So he, he decides to manage Hinder. And I think that there was some definite concern, um, both from us on our side, from the label of could he do it? Could mm -hmm. he be the manager, mm -hmm. right? And from him on his side of, oh my gosh, are they going to, now that they've signed this band, are they going to try to throw me out? Are they going to try to, you know, uh, you know ha bring some heavy hitter manager sure. like someone like yourself, uh -huh. right? And so at the end of the day, Chief and I were connected at the hip with Hinder for years and years. We sold, like I said, three million records on the first one. We probably sold five and a half million records with the band in total. We had a great run. And because it was his first, mm -hmm. um, we, you know, and we just formed a really great bond. Mm. So as we all know, rock starts to evolve and it's struggling and all sorts of stuff is happening in the world of rock music. And Chief calls me up one day and he says, I've got to reinvent myself. You know, I, I, I'm an, I, I live in Vancouver, Canada and I'm, an, I'm a, a rock manager, right? This is not really the way to go right now. And to his credit and brilliance, he went to Nashville, he formed a venture he took a very successful producer, a guy named Joey Moy, who did all the Nickelback records. They all went down to Nashville and they decided to break into to country, which is very difficult to yeah. do. That's very clubby there in Little Old Nashville, isn't it? It is a isn't? very, very, very intimate group of executives. Let yeah. me just put it to you that way. Um, and so anyways, they go down there and the first thing that they sign is Florida Georgia Line. <laughs> That's the first thing that they signed, these two guys. Timing and lighting, folks. Timing and lighting. And, and basically, Chief and I stayed close. And what they did is they cut some songs. They, they had crews on, a, on, a, on an EP. Mm. They put the EP through TuneCore up on iTunes. All independently. And it just was like... Touring and, while this is going on to a playing gigs? A, a little bit. A little bit, okay. A little bit. But what they did that was very, very smart for all of you out there is... They hired an independent radio promoter, but they didn't do any major market promotion. Just and in country, this is really, really effective. They did third tier and fourth, I mean, beyond tertiary markets of radio promotion, because you can get those stations. Mm -hmm. And then the big, big break was when a wonderful executive who runs, pro program director uh, named John Mark, who runs Highways, which is the, which is the country station <laughs> on Sirius Radio, yeah. took the record and put it on. And from that moment on, it was So over. satellite radio is key to help break in that. I listen That's to right. satellite radio all the time, and I'm not a huge country fan, but yeah. I listen to the highway. And yeah. you know what? I'll tell you this. We talk about rock. In so many ways, Tom, that, that's kind of like the southern rock that was Leonard Skinner. It was no 38 questions. Special, and it's, I'm thinking, is that rock? Is that country? Because Florida Georgia Line, that's there's, a fucking rock band. There's right? no question. There's no, <laughs> yeah. there's no look question. Look at him. God bless him. Exactly. That and guy so, looks like Cody Robbins. Look at the guitar player <laughs> and look at Cody <laughs> Robbins, huh? <laughs> I tell you, we could get these seven in there, Code. <laughs> Woo, baby! And, and so, yeah. to, you know, to bring it full circle, to, to have Chief in 2005 mm. be my partner on Hinder and to now have Chief... You know, in 2000, what, what was it we did the deal? 2012, and up until today, be our partner now in Florida, Georgia Line, and future. I mean, Chief is the kind of guy that I will mm -hmm. be, that will be in my life professionally yeah. for the rest of my life. I, I think it's a great lesson for you folks out there that are watching that whole networking and doing the right thing. And, and, and this, what I loved about this story when you told me is you never know when that relationship that starts in a personal way, a thank you or doing the right thing when you could have done another thing, right? Exactly right? The phone calls that I picked up from young people out of the blue when people go, dude, you picked up my phone call. And yeah. I'm thinking, well, God, thank God I freaking picked up his call right. are hugely important Huge. In, a, in a personal business that's, like the music business. That's you know? exactly right. All right, let's take some questions from our wonderful viewers out there. We have a question from Matt David, who's from Shreveport, Louisiana. Put that question up there for me, Code, yep. if you would. Uh, 
All right, he says, Matt David asks, my band was excited to open for Austin Mahone last summer in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I just love saying that, Baton Rouge. I was watching CSI New Orleans last night. Uh, I'm a guitarist, vocalist, songwriter. I've been performing live shows since 2010. I've released two EPs. Since most labels don't accept unsolicited material, what's the best way to get a chance at getting listened to and on a label's radar? Good question. That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think that my answer to a, to a question like that is, by hook or by crook. <laughs> you, you, there, there is no set way. And what I would sit there and say uh, uh, to, in, in response is, don't get stuck um, and, and don't get bogged down by this term of you know, not accepting unsolicited material. Everything's unsolicited until you realize it's great and then all of a sudden you really, really want it. <laughs> right? So I mean, at the end of the day, I think that you know, not accepting unsolicited material, I don't, you gotta fight through that. Mm -hmm. and, and whether it's, I mean, I've had people you know, standing on the sidewalk out in front of the building when we leave to go to lunch, uh -huh. standing there with a CD or standing mm -hmm. there with a, with a tape back in the mm -hmm. day. Um, whether it's, you know, going to shows or going to whatever it is and knowing that executives are there and meeting them and introducing mm -hmm. yourself or what, however you can do it. Mm -hmm. the, the bottom line is, is, is this, is that, as we talked about, it's an unforgiving business. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you cannot do is stop. And you <laughs> cannot ever sit there and say, I can't do this or I'm struggling. Because by the way, that struggle <laughs> and those walls are gonna come up again even when you're signed. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, we talk about this whole idea, you know, I've got a, a little course that I put together all the time I'm saying, but this idea, what I call fuck the gatekeepers, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, it's, exactly it's right. this mentality that you have to just assume that it's gonna be tough. You waste no time talking about it. And at a certain level, you actually start to embrace the craziness of the obstacles and the challenges, and you get a little crazy on it, and you just get through the stuff, you know? Um, let's talk about this. People ask about getting through to people. There's this notion of trusted sources, right, that I talk about all the time. Folks that you've worked with, talk about how important that is to get in your network you know, of those trusted sources so that when something does come in, if, some, you know, if Mark Geiger or somebody calls and says, hey, listen to this, you'll probably listen. If Chief sends you something, you're going to listen to it. How important is that for a person like yourself who is at a level where most people aren't going to get to you? I think that it's critical to this, this notion of yours of trusted sources. I think that it's critical that you have this network of people that you trust and that you respect their tastes and you respect their intuition, all that sort of stuff. The one thing that I would sit there and say that I try to do is this. I try to ignore the name and ignore the title. Because if I don't know you, if you are a program director at a station in market 183 versus you know Kevin Weatherly, who mm -hmm. is a genius, right? Mm -hmm. You have to sit there and spend as much time with the guy or girl coming out of market 183 <laughs> as you do with Kevin. And so from an executive standpoint, the one thing that I would sit there and say is you can't play the name game. Mm -hmm. You can't sit there and say, well, you know, I've got 25 friends of mine and they're all famous and they're, mm -hmm. all, and, and they're all amazing and they're mm -hmm. all on their way to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so I will be too. Mm -hmm. I don't buy that. Yeah. I yeah. think that you have to surround yourself at times with people who are just as hungry and needing a break as you are. Oh, I, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I'm a big fan of give me some people that are hungry and need something That's to right. happen That's right. over somebody that thinks there's a sense of entitlement. That's and right. I will take the hungry, gotta make it happen, That's desperate right. people every time. That's exactly you know? right. It's good. So, okay, let's take another question uh, here from, the, uh, from one of our members, a gentleman by the name of Moss Bioletti. <laughs> who's in a band called the Neo Kalishnikovs from wow. Auckland. I'd love that, huh? Love it. All right. My name is Moss Bioletti. I'm a drummer <laughs> manager of an alt-rock band from Auckland, New Zealand. How does an international young band get on Republic's radar and build a relationship with someone like, somebody like you at the label on a personal basis? Rock on, Moss. God Great bless him. There's rock on its way Great back. Great question. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about New Zealand. Let's talk about Lord. Lord, Jason Great Plum example. talked about it right here on that couch. That's Tommy exactly Blue. right. Let's talk about Gautier, Gautier. another, another example yeah. from, from, from down in Moss's neck of the woods. Um, I think, again, uh, I, I, there is no set way. Here's a couple things to think about. You can do, uh, there's, there's kind of two, two lanes, I think, for Moss, which is we're going to be the biggest band on our block mm -hmm. in Auckland. Then we're gonna be the biggest band on our side of town in Auckland. And then we're gonna be the biggest band in Auckland. And if that, those three things happen by just being really micro, right? Mm -hmm. And really, really focusing on your backyard. Mm 
Mm. Trust me, the phone call are gonna be, they're gonna be coming. Mm. And it's probably gonna be an A&R guy in Australia, whether it's Sony or whether it's Warner Brothers or whether it's Universal. Mm. It's gonna start at that level. Yeah. And you're gonna get a deal, and then it's like, okay, let's bring you to Australia, mm. and then let's go up to Japan. And let's, I'm a big believer in the fact that breaking an artist and an artist happening is almost kind of like a political campaign. Mm -hmm. It's house by house, mm -hmm. high school by high school, county by county. Mm -hmm. And we used to, back in the day, we used to have a war room at Republic where we used to have a map. Mm -hmm. And we would literally put in punch pins when a radio station would add a record. Mm -hmm. And then we would go in and we would mark it in that record, in, that, in, that, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the area where that radio yeah. station was broadcasting. So Moss, first step is be the biggest band on your block. And somebody in Australia or Auckland will pick up the phone. The next thing that you can consider and you can think about if you want to go a different route is sit there and say, okay, I want to be the biggest band in the world, or I want to be the biggest band in, in the United States, or whatever it is, and pack up your bags and move to LA and just fight and scrap. And get here, and it's a roll of the dice, there's no question about it, but this is you know, obviously Smart. a major, major <laughs> hub where everybody is. Either they live here permanently or they're here all the time for work. Um, and so I think that it's like kind of those two lanes when you live in a place like Auckland. I, I think you hit some things that, that, that are so important. You gotta, you gotta own where you start. If, if, when you and I were playing golf, if you couldn't win the junior tournament, unlikely you were gonna win the next level or in college and so forth. There's that winnowing process there, you know? Um, I also love that idea of, of setting a target. Mm -hmm. what it's going to be, and then kind of working backwards. You and I are golfers, so we mm -hmm. think about that way all the time. So when you're playing golf, you start on the first hole, you want to finish on 18, but mm -hmm. you can't get there mm -hmm. in one set. So, so it's all these little mm -hmm. intermediate targets mm -hmm. you hit along the way, which when you keep checking them off the list, then you wind up where you want to be. So I mean, I'll give uh, you an example. Jack Johnson, mm -hmm. when we signed Jack Johnson, Jack Johnson was on an independent label called Enjoy Records, mm -hmm. and Jack Johnson owned... Santa Barbara to Still San does. Diego. <laughs> he just owned it. Uh -huh. I mean, it was like Elvis, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, this is Enjoy Records, which was a great indie label. Mm -hmm. And this guy, Jack Johnson, is doing four, 4,500, 5,000 CDs a week at $12 a clip. And it's from Santa Barbara to San Diego. And so literally, going back to Moss's point about how to become you know, the master of your domain in Auckland, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was literally, we had to have conversations with, with Jack where it was kind of like, Jack, you know, how do we take the, the special sauce that you've done between Santa Barbara and San Diego and do that around the world? Yeah, uh, I, and that's the fun of it too when you get it going because you know, the, the interesting thing, folks, is that when you see some things happening in one place, it kind of demonstrates that it, it's possible, which is important when you're just you know, fighting all the odds all day long. And it makes the story easier for the next guy. When you go to SACTA, you go, do it, you gotta see what's happening in Santa Barbara and San Diego. Mm -hmm. And the more stories you have to tell, I find, right? Mm -hmm the better it gets. So it's all about keep building your stories out there, folks, one at a time, and you might wind up where you want to be. Uh, let's take a break for a moment. We're talking about this idea of learning. People ask me all the time how you learn the music business, you know, hanging out with smart folks, asking questions is my recipe. Um, a while back, I started to take this whole idea of mentoring um, aspiring artists and professionals seriously. So about a year ago, we did this wacky course called Red Man U, is my online insider's guide to the music business. It was all very kind of loose and so forth. We decided to take all that stuff and put it into a real course here, right? Uh, in a much more formal way. So I want to show it to you folks real quick because if you're serious about learning the music business, uh, I think it's something you'll want to check out. There it is. You, uh, when you sign up for our course, um, I won't take you to the front page of the website, um, you'll see that it's, uh, it's my insider's guide. And what it is is, you know, it's, it's 10 big lessons about the music business. We'll call them modules, big picture, making great music, treating your careers and business. All of these areas that we cover are what things that I think are what you actually have to know about the music music business. Within each of these, there'll be a number of lessons, three to five minutes long, that are easily digestible to try to break it down into little pieces that you can understand. And I'll give you an example. We're talking about picking a target here, right? So if you were looking at trying to get your head in the right place and, and you're 
back to Marco or to Mr. Bialioti, you got to pick a target. So on each of these lessons, you'll see we have a little video, three, five minutes long. Uh, it's all transcribed there for you. We uh, will also have a little lesson quiz down there at the bottom for you to make sure you're paying attention, that you understand these ideas. And, and then what we've done is because I think networking is so important in meeting people. Um, as Tom and I discussed, today's business, you can touch and feel and get the information from people that you could have never gotten previously. So go back to the page there, Code. So I'm going to introduce you to some of these smart people that we've had along the way that in a way that'll give you some insight and some other people's opinion to show you that there are people doing I want you to understand how they think. So all that for a mere 99 bucks. Tom, nice. uh, which helps keep the bills paid here at Red Man MB. <laughs> nice. And by the way, without you know shatting on any of the other fine institutions out there that are teaching the music business for a lot more money, and I hate to say it, it's typically people that are theorizing or discussing the music business. And you know, when you're, you and I are playing golf, we ain't going down to watch the twenty handicap hit balls. You want to learn from the doers, folks. Mm -hmm. So, and we got a great one here today. So I hope you'll check out that course on that on our event page. Go go to the event page real quick. There's a link to a free preview for you folks if you're interested in checking out, but I'm convinced it's the best music biz education you're going to get out there, period, much less for a mere hundred dollars, not even <laughs> a penny short. Uh, Tom, let's talk about making records, yeah. okay? You got to find them, you got to get them signed, you got to get them through all that stuff, and then... Um, a job of an A&R person is to get the best record out of that artist. Fair comment? Absolutely. So, Let it down. Um, here's what I wonder. Talk about what happens. You've signed a band. Now, talk about that idea of selecting producers, budgets, you know, you know, what goes on after the band has made their big day and gets signed right. As you point out, it's just the beginning. What happens next? Well, I think what we then do is we kind of sit down and we uh, obviously, you know, all the hoopla goes away. <laughs> All the, now the, we're yeah, married. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, and we really get down to kind of brass tacks. Mm. And at the end of the day, where you, where you really start is you start with, okay, what is the condition and the shape of the music that got you your deal to begin with? Mm. Are these rough demos and we're starting over at zero? Mm. Are these finished records and ready to go to, ready to, go to market and mm. maybe just need a mix or a master mm. and out the door we go? But if it's a situation whereby you know, we are, you know, you're basically starting over and starting from mm. zero. You have to get to know the band. You mm. have to get to know the artist. You have to get to know them personally. Figure out, do they like to sing in the morning? Do they like to sing at night? Do they like to drink a lot? Do they not like to be around alcohol? Do they like to, do they like to record in, 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 the, in Atlanta? Or are they more about going to Buffalo and freezing their ass off? Mm. And you have to kind of get to, it's, it's like you said, now we're married. You have to get to kind of know them. And then you have to kind of start to talk about, okay, when you close your eyes at the end of the day and you're laying in bed and you're imagining the greatest record you've ever made, what does it sound like, mm -hmm. right? What's it sound like? What is the tones? What's the drums sound like? What are the guitars like? What are your vocals like? How polished is it? How raw is it? And you start to build a narrative, right, mm -hmm. of all of these things that all matter. Mm -hmm. I like to sing in the morning, and I want double kick drums and death metal. Okay, uh -huh. so it all starts kind of like coming together. And then for an A&R person, you know, your job is to then, as they're talking about this and as you're learning these little nuances to, to your act, is to be like, okay, who are the four or five guys that can make this record? Yeah. Who are the four or five guys that can get in a room with, you, with your band or with your artist for three months, and no one's going to kill each other, and no <laughs> yeah, one's going no to like walk out, mm -hmm. but... It's gonna be rocky at times, and they're gonna be challenged, and they're going to be constructively criticized along the way, all for the betterment of the record, mm -hmm. right? And so what I like to do is I come up with a list of four or five producers, and then we start having either conference calls or meetings. We share music. I, want, I, want, I will get on the phone with a producer and I'll say, don't tell me what you like about this band. Tell me what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think can be better. Band's not in the room for that. Call. Band is totally in the room. Oh, really? Okay. I want them to yeah. hear that. Right? Yeah. I want the first conversation to be between a producer and the band to be, tell me what you don't like. I know yeah. you're here. Yeah. You wouldn't be here if you didn't like it. We can waste time talking about mm -hmm. 10 minutes as to why it's so great. Let's actually spend 10 minutes on what's wrong with it mm -hmm. and how I can get better. Mm -hmm. And at this process, what, what I like to do is to do a series of conversations, conference calls or meetings with four or five guys. And after a while, it becomes incredibly apparent 
who the right person is to make mm-hmm. the record. Yeah. And off we go. Yeah. Great stuff there. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, when a band is done making that record, in my experience with Incubus and other bands that I've worked with, that sometimes you'll think you're done. You, <laughs> you get away from it, right? You mean done with the music? Done with the music. Uh-huh. You think you're done making the record, but right. you sit there and you start thinking about the marketing of the record and how this is going to play in the marketplace. And assuming, folks, that you need one or two great songs to open the key to mm-hmm. the castle, and if you whiff on the first two keys, they might not see what's in the castle, you know? How do you deal with situations when you've got a record done and you go, you know what, I don't think we have what we need. We don't have the single. We don't have the right mix. How does that work? Well... <clears throat> Does that happen often for you? Sure, it does. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 you know, eh, they often equate uh, passing legislation and politics to making sausage, right? It's pretty, <laughs> pretty ugly to watch sausage be made. Mm. Um, and I think that at times there's a little bit of truth to that in mm. in this world that we're in. Um, what I like to do is along the way. I am always kind of check having kind of like a mental check in with the rest of my company. Mm-hmm. And as demos are getting flushed out, okay, great. This is cool. This nine-minute death metal thing is great. But over here, track three, this is the single. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is the one. And so as things are going, you know, I don't think it's a matter of, okay, we, we go into the studio, we close our eyes, we put our blinders on, and we make a record. And then the next day, we're, three months later, we're done, and we walk out, and we're like, oh, shit, now there's marketing and promotion that's got to happen. Mm-hmm. Those things are, those wheels are churning as you literally are starting the writing process. Mm-hmm. And so to avoid the, oh, no, we don't have a single, you have to introduce the marketing and the promotion, at least in your head and in the band's head at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that oftentimes, look, it's the beauty of what we do. Um, Sometimes that record doesn't work out. Sometimes that mix isn't the right Mm -hmm. mix. It's the beauty of the fact that when you go in to make a record, I say this all the time, you may have three or four single ideas when you start, and when you finish, one or two of them may have completely gone off a cliff. And that's not because people didn't try yeah. and people didn't work hard. Mm. It's art. It's not math, it's art. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's good stuff. It's interesting because you know, we had Alex the Kid in here, and I think for lots of artists and you know, for managers, it's much more intuitive, you know, where you start at some point in that recording process, the singles start to talk to you. Um, I, I rarely talked about that with the band when, when it was in the mix, but it was interesting to hear Alex the Kid, producer, one of your, your friends over at, uh, in the Universal Group, was very conscious about thinking of that marketing and how things would play out Critical. while they were in the process. And, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a key point for people out there when you're making a music, right, that the label has experience and expertise in how to make that music happen. And so often an artist will think, hey, we're making the record, go fuck yourself. But money wants an opinion. And, and, and smart money, label money, people that have done this, um, it's worth listening to, folks, because this is what we do, right? And you only get one crack. There's no mulligans on a record <laughs> once mm-hmm. it comes out. Uh, you kind of got what you got, you know? That's right. Um, all right, let's take another question here from one of our uh, listeners. Uh, who do we, what's, I forgot her name, Co. Flip that one up there for me, would you? <sighs> what a fine team we have here. Nice. Huh? Okay. Uh, Cheryl Gotha asks, Hi, Tom. As a young singer on the verge of accomplishing my first EP, would it be a step closer to the music industry to send it to radio stations or to labels? Where do you think I would have the most success? So she's thinking down the road a little bit already. Is. She is. Uh, it's a great question, and my answer to you would be to actually send it to both. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and, and also the local promoter, mm-hmm. and also the local music writer for the local paper or blog or whatever mm-hmm. it is. I, I think at the end of the day, that when you are you know, a young aspiring artist and you've got an EP and you've got this new material, get it out. Mm-hmm. I'm a big believer, even back in the day with, with you know, when, when songs were leaking and, and, and everything was, everything with Bitcoin I and mean, when things were getting hacked and all this sort of stuff, mm-hmm. I was all about it. Mm-hmm. I was all about it. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, I mean, if, if anybody remembers, uh, one of the biggest hacking stories was Madonna's Ray of Light. Mm-hmm. William Orbit produced that record. It's a brilliant record. I'm not mm-hmm. really a huge Madonna mm-hmm. fan, but yeah. that's a brilliant album. Yeah. And they took the files and they came out of William's studio and they went to go mix them. And the unmixed files leaked and went everywhere. It was mm-hmm. Madonna. Yeah. 
when Ray of Light came out, that to date was her biggest sound scan first week of her yeah. career. Yeah. But People the record heard. had leaked. Yeah. Because it was great. Yeah. And so my point to anybody is, is at the end of the day, I feel like there's sometimes people, artists, uh, and everybody, we can all be guilty of it, is to create something and then you, you, you're a little, maybe it's a little bit of being afraid, maybe it's overthinking and you're kind of keeping things to the vest. Uh-uh. Get it out. Yeah. Get it out and get it to everybody. It's great advice, and it is kind of scary. It's funny, Tom, for years, you know, I've been the, the grisly professional giving editorial, and Brandon Boyd from Incubus started kidding me when I started doing this web show that I turned into a fucking neurotic wreck, you know, worried about everything. And we, we were doing this course. Cody will be over there smiling. I kept wanting to make it perfect. I kept wanting to make it perfect. I wanted to, and, and then at some point I thought, dude, what's perfect? It's the internet. If, it, if you get a perfect idea, you can record it tonight and put it up tomorrow. Get, get, get rolling on it. Good advice for everybody out there. Um, you now preside over an A and R team, if I'm not mistaken, right? So it's not just you. You now have to play coach and mm -hmm. boss, or you know, mm -hmm. manager, or whatever, to your team. Uh, lots of folks I find when they're thinking about working at a record company, they either want Jimmy Iovine's job or Lucian's job, or they want to be an A and R guy. It's kind of mm -hmm. like the scoring positions, you know. Um, when you're building out your A and R team, um, what are you looking for in A and R executives rather than when you're looking for a band? Well, it's a great question. I mean, you know, when I was back in New York, I, 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 now I'm at, now out here in Los Angeles and I've been here for three years, but when I was in New York, I was basically the head of A&R for the first almost 15 years of the company. Mm -hmm. um, you, you obviously have to bring in people who are very competitive, very ambitious, people who eat, breathe, and sleep music. You know, get, give me a little bit of sunlight, some raw meat, and I'm good for a week. Um, you know, I say to people all the time that this is not a job, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. This is like being in the mafia. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not 10 to 6 and all, you know, it's cocktails at 6.15 on a Friday. Mm -hmm. You know, I am working, what, you know, now it's like with The Voice and with, you know, having just finished mm -hmm. 50 Shades of Grey, which mm -hmm. is coming out in a week. Mm -hmm. That's 24 hours, 7 mm -hmm. days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and so... You have to find people who have music in their blood and like, an, like a young and up and coming mm -hmm. artist that will not take no for an mm -hmm. answer and will not stop at the first brick wall. Mm -hmm. You have to find an executive like that. Um, it's also, I think, critical in the modern record label kind of uh, ecosphere that you get people who can kind of now work together. The beauty of Republic Records, Rob Stevenson is now the head of a &R based in New York, and he has put together a team of people that we all work together. When you look at a song like Bang Bang, who mm. came out this year, mm. huge number one hit that Republic Records put out with Nicki Minaj and Jesse J and Ariana Grande. I mean, you talk about Take a Village. That took 20 people to make that record. And it's absolutely brilliant. Mm. You know, when you look at what, what, what I was fortunate enough to just work on and release to the marketplace, which is two singles from Fifty Shades of Grey. You've got a Max Martin written song with Ellie Goulding going to pop and top 40. And you've got a Stefan Macchio weekend record going to urban and to rhythm and that, that are both monster smash hits. 15 people had their hands on that, on, the, on that project. So the old days of, I'm an A&R guy, here's my silo. Mm -hmm. Go away, and I'll let you know yeah. when everything's ready to go to market. I think that that's a that's the, those days have passed. Yeah, it's, it was rock band kind of thing that's where you exactly go in right. there with your guys. It's the five guys, that's and right. the producer, and you don't even have to you hardly have to show up. Do we still have Don on the phone, by the way? Uh, we might. You want to find out? Yeah, and yeah, because I want to take a couple more questions. And uh, Don, you on? Yeah, I'm here. What's up, Steve? All right, we got Don Borza on the phone with us, who's been waiting patiently. I wrote that Hi, down Don. on a piece of paper, and I just turned it over, Don, going, oh, fuck, I forgot about Don there. Uh, Don, you're well, on I got with... A chance, I got a chance to hear the whole show while I have thoughts. It was great. Tom is terrific. Thanks for coming out, Tom. Steve, you have a great show. And, and you know, you mentioned about your, uh, your, uh, your website course. You know, I, I look at justifying a hundred bucks is taking you out to lunch, and I'll get two hours with you. <laughs> Otherwise, I get a hundred bucks, I get twenty-two hours with you, and then some. So your course has been terrific. All right. Well, actually, you know what? If I'd known you were going to give that unqualified <laughs> endorsement, I would have had you fucking on the couch there, Don. <laughs> Shit, cut it. That you better be taping that, Cody, <laughs> or you're freaking out of here. Okay, Don, you had a question about the much ballyhooed three hundred and sixty deals. Fire away. Yeah, my question is for Tom. 
when I and I'm, I'm all about the money, like uh, like Steve says. Uh, I spent 25 years in the film and television business, so now I'm branching off into the music business because my investment group says, "Why aren't we doing music?" I says, "Because I don't fucking know. I got to learn it." So um, uh, the question is, why would a band sign a 360 deal uh, with the record sales declining and and with the actual live events creating most of the money? Well, it's a great question. Uh, nice to meet you, Don. By the way, um, pleasure. You know, I mean, look, I think at the end of the day, uh, I, I think that um, when you're playing the major label game, when you want to be on a Columbia Records or a Republic Records or a Def Jam or whatever else, it's, it's one of those scenarios where uh, it is part of the conversation that artists and managers and lawyers kind of have to have these days. Um, as we all know, the record labels are going through a very, very difficult period of time. Um, the, the financial stress and strain on the record labels has, is, is at the highest levels it's probably seen in 30 or 40 years. I agree. Um, and what that inevitably does is it actually hurts the business. It hurts creativity. It hurts discovery. It hurts, you know, I mean, think about it back in the day when you, when you think back to the 60s and the 70s about how, you know, artists like Springsteen got mm -hmm. that second record. And we're able to make that second record of which Born to Run was on. Yeah. To be able, you know, in this modern day era, it's almost, it's, at times it feels like an egg timer. Yeah. So what we're trying to do, Don, is we're trying to actually prop ourselves up um, whereby, you know, we can have a more rounded experience with an artist. What, what re, re, Don, I think that where you're starting to see a lot of record labels evolve from is even the idea of being a record label and thinking of themselves more on the line of being a media company, an mm. entertainment company, that is going to invest in your tour, that mm. is going to invest in your show, that is not just gonna sit there and say, here, pay me, mm. but is actually going to invest in to reap the rewards out. Yeah. Because when you look at the, the economics of the music industry and associate it with being an investor in a company, so if the Ren Man here sees Apple, mm. and the Ren Man says, okay, I'm gonna put $500,000 of my money in Apple. For the next 15 years as Apple grows, your stake stays the same and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. It's the exact opposite for a record label. Yeah, they gotta you keep take $500,000 and you invest it in the artist, mm -hmm. mostly that, that stake gets smaller and dwindled mm -hmm. down yeah. as the artist gets bigger and bigger and bigger mm -hmm. and you were the one that discovered them and invested in them. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way whereby you know we're trying to kind of at the same time, prop ourselves up and make ourselves still functional, mm -hmm. um, and also at the same time, really, really become more that 360 enhancement for the Yeah, artist. I think too, as a manager, you spend a lot of time on the other side of, uh, of the fence with labels, you know? Um, I think it's easy to dismiss that role of being the banker, the one that's, that's putting right. out all the money. The concert promoters put out money, and when that's they're right. wrong, they find out pretty quick. But the, the, the labels um, are playing banker. And, and the truth of the matter is, for all the folks out there, you know, when record sales have dropped the way, album sales, not music, people are listening to more music than ever, but That's the right. album sales that supported the business have dropped, um, it was only inevitable that, the, that the, it was going to contract somewhere. So um, I think the moral of the story is if you're signing one of those 360 deals, the reason you need one is, unless you have all the money, all the infrastructure, and all the experience because it takes all three of those and the talent and the great songs, right? Um, you need a label. Even if you had those things, you'd have to know who to hire and all that. And it's not easy. I say this to people all the time. The labels, this is what they do for a living. And the economics have changed. And perhaps over time with streaming and all yeah. these things play out, uh, it'll change a little bit. Uh, Don, hold, on, hold on one second. Oh, hey, Don, you still there? Yeah, yeah. You know, the other thing I would just say, and I'd say to everybody at home as well, is that you know, there's a flip side to giving up 360 rights, which is leverage back to you as the artist. And there's nothing wrong right. with sitting there saying, great, okay, fine. I'm going to give you, you know, whatever it is, X percentage of mm -hmm. my touring or X percentage of this or X percentage of that. Great. Okay, label, what are you going to do for right. me? Mm -hmm. What support am I getting right, on right. the ground? What support am I getting in Sheboygan next mm -hmm. Wednesday so I can sell another 300 tickets and max out my back end? Yeah. What, what are you guys right. going to do to help me sell more? If I can do a follow-up follow, follow question, it'd be real quick. Is it what kind of support do the labels have with live venues and or events? Let's say a walk-in festival over in Europe. What kind of pull does a major le label have with 
getting someone a higher billing over at, at, at a big festival event. Well, that's just it. I mean, to my point, I think that's where we're now trying to grow away from just being a record company into being an entertainment company. And what you're right. seeing at Universal Music Group and at Sony and all these other other music groups is they're actually bringing in these experts mm. who actually have the relationships yeah. with the festival guys, can actually flex a little bit and use their leverage because we may have two or three of the headliners. Okay, great. So take two or three of our new and developing acts and help us break these acts. Mm. And so you're seeing, right. Don, that exact thing where the labels are now, this is not... It can't be looked at anymore by either the artist or the label. This is not an accounting transaction. Mm -hmm. This is another layer of work for us all to do together. Yeah, and uh, you know what, Don? It's always been a very clubby business, and, and the people that have succeeded in the business have influence because they've succeeded. And, you know, a big label can add a lot. And we talk about it in our course about picking your partners. And, and while most people wouldn't consider a label their partner, the truth is if you're going to break big, they are your partner. It may yeah. not be the, the descriptive right. you know, term legally, but that's what it winds up being in the best scenario. A great artist needs a great right. label, great manager working together. Uh, some great things can happen. Cody, we had a couple of questions. Don, thanks so much for calling in, and thanks for that uh, endorsement here. Cody, we do have that on. It's recorded, correct? <laughs> That's right. All right, just want to check. Lot, guys. Have, a, have a great day. Thank guys. you, right, Don. Have thanks a, great day. a lot. Uh, I love it. You know, guy who's in, you know, getting in the music business. I, I try to talk everybody out, but nobody listens. Okay, we had a couple other questions for folks that aspire to be an A&R folks. Did we, have, did we go over those, Code? We have our friend. Okay, here's a great question for you. Um, I love these here. Danielle Howard asks, Hi, Ren Man and Tom. Coming from a small town in Arizona and being a senior in high school, what's my best route to break through and become a big-time record exec like you at a record label, uh, Tom? Uh, great question. I would suggest to intern over and over and over yes. and over again starting your freshman year in college. If they allow that as a freshman in college, I'm not sure that they do. But I got to tell you, um, I've been fortunate enough to hire over the years some incredible uh, executives that are all doing different things. Uh, you know, Imran Majid is, a, is an A&R guy at Columbia who signed Turn Down for What last year. We've had him on hit. the show. Yeah, and um, Maureen Kenny is a very, very successful uh, A&R executive now at Atlantic who signed MGM, and of Monsters and Men. The list goes on and on. All interns. And so what I sit there and say, Republic has an intern program that we take very, very seriously. We interact with our interns on a daily basis. We meet with them. Each individual department will meet with them on a Friday to teach them about what they do. We sit down, we spend time with them. And at the end of the day, I am a big believer, and it may be a little bit controversial, but uh, spend $99 and get the Ren Man's University program. Buy Donald, <laughs> buy Donald Passman's book and go to work and become an intern and be the best intern that you are every single day. Smoke every other intern in the room and eventually you will get a job at a record level. I couldn't agree more. And I, so for some of the new folks that are watching today, Cody Romnus over here, who was a USC football player who I'd met at a couple industry nice, events and in, nice. in, in Kira O'Neill as well. Um, Cody got his job working here, not because he had a music business degree from USC, but because he came in here and started working. And one day, Tom, I came back from hitting some golf balls at our favorite place in the world. And, I, and you folks can't see in my bathroom here in the office, there's a glass shower, which has never been used. But my wife thought it'd be a great idea to have one as a freaking closet, right? <laughs> and so for years, stuff piled up there. I came back one day, it was all gone, right? And I thought, and I came out to the guy in the office, Joe, and I said, Joe, what the hell happened to all that stuff? He goes, that, that kid cleaned it up and put it around. I came back a week later, all of a sudden the shed was done. So when people wonder why I hired Cody Romnus, it's because for all you folks, I'm being serious now, he showed the right attitude. He was going to mm -hmm. make something happen. He was going to mm -hmm. go take care of the dirty work. And by the way, instead of sitting on the fucking bench, he volunteered for the freaking kickoff team mm -hmm. where they take 20 yards back and bang into right. each other. Okay, right. I'm thinking, my kind of guy. And then I met Kira O'Neill who's been spotted head-butting people at concerts but they got in her way, <laughs> choking him a little bit. And she's come out here to, to intern as well. And, and some of my greatest, yeah. greatest, and with Jim Guarino, I could go oh, on. It's unbelievable. Big time players all started with, uh, dude, uh, give me my coffee, right. would you? That's right. And did it with great pride. That's exactly right. Great pride. All right, great. Let me talk about you. I know you got to get out of here, but I want to talk about one final thing before you get going. Um, you mentioned uh, that you've been working on things outside the typical A&R 
of signing a band. You've worked on TV projects and soundtracks and The Voice. Talk about those other things that you do uh, if your day wasn't busy enough managing your A&R team and presiding over records. Well, I just find it to be really, really exciting and really challenging. I think it's it's also kind of it's the new frontier. I think that what you're seeing in in um, you know, I, I mean, at the you know, there there is always in me going to be a major part of my heart that just adores the idea of finding a band, signing a band, making a record, and releasing it. Um, but to sit there and to spend 14 months, like I just did, working on Fifty Shades of Grey that you know 150 million readers are counting the days down before that gets mm. released and working with the director and working with the studio and piecing together this music and making a musical experience weave within a film mm. is a level of creativity that I haven't done before. Mm. And so whether it's you know some of the stuff we've been able to do on The Voice or The Hunger Games or Walking Dead or now Fifty Shades of Grey, it's like a it's like another layer of an onion to kind mm. of peel off, and it's been really really challenging, and and incredibly at times difficult to do, but it's been incredibly worthwhile, yeah. you know. And and I think that it's like, I mean, look, they always sit there and say this all the time about pitchers, right? You got one great pitch, you're going to get in the major leagues. Mm. You got two great pitches, you're going to have a career, and if you have three great pitches, you're going to Cooperstown. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny, too, because when you talk about all those things, when I started in the business, you know, you heard music on the radio, you read about it in Rolling Stone, and the ways you heard about it were much different. Today, more so than ever, I think, and, it, and it's an adjustment for some artists, is that you got to find the people where they are today. That's right. Whether it's video games, whether it's TV shows. When The Voice came out, i got to be honest, I wasn't a big fan of it, but it's beyond just great music now. There's great theater there and great people and interaction and all these things. And I suppose if you're an artist out there, I would say don't get precious about where your music gets heard because the risk of somebody misinterpreting or you winding up in the wrong place is so far overwhelmed by the fact that your music will show up nowhere mm -hmm. that you'll sort it out later and things like the voice and all these soundtracks we had a great soundtrack team at epic records when i worked there um, are just n another great way to get your music out there into the world uh, kira before we split any uh questions on the chat room there yes actually we got well you've been so Yay. freaking yeah. quiet over there I yeah, by the way, folks, she is so not good. quiet. <laughs> Kira is the most unshy freaking woman I've ever met in my Come life. On, Kira. Short Sorry, of my guys. wife. Come on. I just want to hear what Tom's saying because it's so good stuff here. Okay. But we got a great uh, success story from your friend Kristen in New Jersey who visited here in April. Kirsten Spruch. Yep. She she went from intern and got herself a publicist gig in New York City. God bless and you. And thanking you for that advice that you gave her. I met her, her when she was 15. Exactly. Yeah, she's You know, incredible. I had to be careful. So, you know, the internet, 15-year-olds, old guys, you know, you got to be careful these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's good for you, Kirsten. Kirsten has got great ambition, great yeah. kid, you know, and but definitely. Dedicated, you yeah. know, and I could tell when she was 15 years old. I thought this chick's on fire, man. Yeah, and she must have had some great parents. What else you got in there? Um, we had a guest from Canada actually who'd be interested in trying out oh, for the voice and want to know if there's a way to kind of sidestep the the whole legalities <laughs> of that. <laughs> uh, the the yes, you can absolutely the 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 voice because it is uh, uh, franchised and licensed around the world. Uh, does not allow uh, folks from out who are not United States citizens to audition for the United States Voice. So, for the person that that you are chatting with there, um, uh, we can uh, we'll connect with them after the show, and I Perfect. can connect with them with the Canadian Voice, and they can get dialed up for the Canadian Voice. Making it happen Fantastic. here for you, folks. <laughs> okay, uh, what would that have happened in the old days? Time you call up, and I'm on the phone with the fucking manager of Led Zeppelin, going, dude. Any way I can come up to the exactly. to the top floor of the hideout? You know, get out of here, kid. You're all gone. All right. Anything else in there, Kira? Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Please do. Yeah. Fire away. Um, the pay is low, but the intrinsic <laughs> reward fire, is high. Fire away. Well, I, you're talking about the Fifty Shades of Grey. I know that there is. Um, Look into a, the camera, Kira. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Here here I'm go. talking directly at you. Yeah. Um, there is a gentleman from Florida, a young musician, said to have been working on that by the name of Boots. Are you familiar with him and his background? With scoring some of the Fifty Shades of Grey stuff? Uh, I, I am. I'm familiar with the name. I mean, when you're, you know, a project like that is, uh, you know, there's, it's, again, it's kind of like it takes a village. Um, so we were very, very fortunate enough to, I mean, obviously you have the legendary Danny Elfman who, 
back then. Oingo Boingo I booked mean, him a hundred times. The man, yeah. I mean the man. Yeah. Um, he was kind of leading the way on the creative with, with the score and some of the stuff that went in the film, but really, I, I am familiar with Boots uh, and, and, and obviously very familiar with what he does. Uh, and, and again, we, we were all very, very lucky to have a pretty great team of folks working cool. on that project. Awesome. Anything else, Kira? Nope. Um, I mean, we could go on and nope. on for yeah, I got, hours Tom's got, questions, Tom's got a real job. All right. <laughs> He's got a real job here. All right. Uh, okay, well, first off, before we leave, I want to say thank you to all the folks back there, Kira and, and Cody, for always doing a freaking great job. I want to thank all those people, those advanced planners out there that posted their questions in advance. Um, and uh, thank you for participating. For all you people on the, uh, in the chat room, uh, I'm glad you could make it. Um, and, uh, and also to say thank you to Tom here, of course, you know. Uh, before pleasure. we leave, though, uh, let me talk about some up. Thank you, Code. Very nice. <laughs> uh, upcoming shows here next week, folks. Uh, we've got a good February here. Um, we talked about rock going away, but it's coming back next week here. we got the incomparable guitar virtuoso, Mr. Steve Vai, who wow. I first met when I was working at Epic Records. Very nice. Um, he's going to tell a great story about how he lent an instrument to Mikey Einziger in Incubus, who did hey, Aqueous nice. Transmission. Great song, great story. Anyway, Steve Vai is going to be joining us. So if you ever picked up a guitar and dreamed of doing something big, you will definitely want to be watching next week. And here's one for, I know Tom will likely be watching. Feel free to call in. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to have, guess, <laughs> I guess, Mr. Gary McCord. There he is. Nice. <laughs> McCord, gee, man, they call him magic out on tour. He's probably, I'm going to try to get him to do a magic trick. Gary is a golf announcer and former golf professional, which may make everybody go, so what does that have to do with music? He's also a big lover of music, and you'll attest to this. There are so many great connections and in, in, in similarities between that golfing, competitive mind and the music mind, the lifestyle, you go on the road, you have to deliver, you got to do the gigs, you know, you get shitty paying gigs and all that stuff. And, uh, and Gary also turned, to, uh, you know, a kind of moderate golf career into something much bigger as an announcer. So we'll talk about all that stuff about dreaming and doing and, and the similarities between the golf mind and the rugby. Um, that's it. For, we hear the phone ringing. You're too late, folks. That's my oh. final. Are they until you got them on the line? Too, too late. Folks, moral of that story is you got to show up on time or you miss the train. <laughs> All right, that's it for today. My name is Steve Rennie. The, web, the website, did I say the website? The re website is renmanmusicandbusiness.com. The show's Red Man Live. I am the Red Man, and I am out of here. See ya. <laughs>